so this is the first of our snippets uh, for this week, which is, which is going to look at the emergence of um, of Al Qaeda, which is you know, I think the dominant issue in the Bush administration. So the backdrop is here in Afghanistan. Um, remember, we've, we've looked at Afghanistan before. The U.S. aided these anti-Soviet uh, rebels, the Mujahideen. And then after the Soviets withdraw, the U.S. basically pulls out of Afghanistan as well. So from 87 till 93, 94, the U.S. has very little engagement with um, with Afghanistan. And this is a period in which the the communist, uh, pro-Soviet communist government is, is uh, eventually toppled, where the country descends into civil war, um, which pits various of the factions against each other, um, uh, various of the factions that have fought the Soviets, and eventually this extremely hardline uh, group, uh, the Taliban, uh, takes uh, takes over. Um, this is a group with a very, should we say, unappealing uh, domestic uh, uh, philosophy. Um, women and girls are, are basically barred from the public square. They're barred from um, uh, 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 girls are barred from education. Um, uh, the Taliban target any minority religions. This famous photo of their um, uh, the Taliban government blowing up a, a, a Buddhist uh, a rock carving that had existed for uh, for centuries. Um, and uh, the, the they they impose order, but impose order through a, a, a far right authoritarian uh, government. For our purposes, though, the critical aspect of the Taliban is that they work in concert with this new terrorist organization, Al Qaeda, um, which is headed by a man who, as we all know, Osama bin Laden, who saw himself as uh, as a figure who would unify the uh, the Islamic world under his leadership, um, and who he comes from a very very wealthy Saudi family, um, is is particularly embittered at the Saudi leadership uh, for. Um, uh, for, uh, in, in his mind, desecrating Islam by allowing American troops to be stationed in, um, uh, in the Saudi kingdom. So he's, uh, he's fanatically anti-American, he's strongly anti-Saudi, uh, uh, um, and he, you know, he's, he's seen the, the events of the Middle East in the 1980s, the emergence of Hezbollah in, in, uh, in Lebanon, the state-sponsored terrorism of the Iranians, um, and he senses correctly uh, that that terrorism is a way uh, to potentially strike at the um, uh, at the US um, uh, figures in American intelligence, you know, sense what he's doing. The most important of them is uh, uh, this uh, man named Richard Clark, um, who will later head uh, a, a cross-agency unit called the Bin Laden unit to try to, to, to try to ta uh, track him. The, the Clinton administration, and I think Bill Clinton himself, senses the dangers that uh, that Bin Laden poses. The United States authorizes a raid on, uh, on uh, Bin Laden holdings in the Sudan which in the 1990s was was ruled by an anti-American uh, military government, uh, Sada, uh, uh, Osama, um, uh, briefly uh, uh, lived uh, in the Sudan before uh, being exiled to Afghanistan in 1996. Um, but the, the Sudan attack doesn't really deter um, al-Qaeda in any meaningful way. And instead, in 1998, in an attack that should have gotten, you know, it got a lot of attention, but it should have gotten infinitely more attention than than it did. There's a joint um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda attack on the US embassies in Tanzania um, and in Kenya, these two countries in East Africa. Um, and the goal of Al-Qaeda was to, was to be able to strike at American soil. This, this was their belief that if they could strike it on you know, American targets that would uh, distinguish them from other terrorist groups. It would it would enable their uh, uh, intensify their their recruiting. Um, but in in the late '90s, they didn't think that they had the strength to to carry out a terrorist attack inside the United States itself. So the idea was, all right, we'll go for U.S. embassies, which are technically under under international law, our American soil. And so they start looking for embassies where the the security was was relatively lax, and in, in, in East Africa, it's not as if there seemed to be major security threats. So um, the, these these attacks uh, are, are carried out on the same day; they're carried out within minutes of each other. This is an extremely sophisticated attack. So it's clear after nineteen, if, you know, 
to the public, to Congress, um, by 1988, uh, that this is not not a typical uh, terrorist uh, organization. Nonetheless, there are real limitations in terms of how Clinton is able to respond. Um, you know, the the uh, the. Uh, embassy attacks um, lead to U.S. strikes in Afghanistan with cruise missiles, uh, which which don't really do much of anything. Um, the year features this this film called Wag the Dog, um, and the, the plot line of this is that a, um, a, a, a political consultant for a president who's in trouble uh, comes up with the idea of of sort of uh, inventing a terrorist threat to the uh, to the United States. <laughs> Was by Albania of all countries, um, and and launching an attack in Albania as a way of detracting from a domestic uh, scandal, and in, this is the the year of the Clinton Lewinsky scandal. The president has been having this affair with a White House intern. Um, he uh, he encourages her to lie in a in a civil suit um, filed by another ex employee that he tried to proposition, um, who's suing him for sexual harassment. This gets tied up into a broader impeachment. Uh, uh, proceeding. And so th this, I think, is the best example of the way in which Clinton's um, personal foibles uh, hurt public policy as a whole. I mean, you know, again, the, the, the attacks on the 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 um, the, Tanz the Tanzania and Kenya embassies were an attack on American soil, but the U.S. response was really quite um, quite muted. And so Al Qaeda strikes again in 2000. Uh, they they um, uh, prepare and and implement a suicide murder attack on a U.S. naval vessel called the USS Cole. Um, that's uh, that's uh, refueling in Yemen, the country uh, right to the south of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, with which the U.S. had a quite distant relationship, and the refueling effort is a way of, of attempting to harmonize the, uh, uh, the relationship. The problem is that Yemen has a significant number of al-Qaeda sympathizers. Uh, uh, the, you, the, it's, a, it's a suicide boat in this case. They, they, you can see they rammed the boat with, with a bomb. On the side of the boat, and uh, several dozen um, American service members are, are are killed. And again, Clinton um, meets this with a with a, a cruise missile strike on um, Al Qaeda territories in Afghanistan, which which doesn't seem to um, uh, meet the 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 full extent of the uh, of the attack. The irony is that in the 2000 campaign, Al Qaeda doesn't. You know, Despite these attacks, it's not a major issue in the race between the vice president, Democratic uh, uh, former Senator Al Gore, and the Republican uh, George uh, W. Bush, the governor of Texas, the son of the former president. W. Bush, in fact, in 2000, uh, seems to chastise the uh, the Clinton administration for being excessively aggressive in foreign affairs. And let's take a listen. This is from uh, from one of the presidential debates. Should the people of the world look at the United States, uh, Governor, and say, should they fear us? Should they welcome our involvement? Should they see us as a friend, everybody in the world? How do you, how would you project us around the world as president? Well, I think they'll look at us as a, uh, as a country that understands freedom, where it doesn't matter who you are or how you're raised or where you're from, that you can succeed. Uh, I don't think they'll look at us with envy. Uh, it really depends upon how the, our nation conducts itself in foreign policy. If we're an arrogant nation, they'll, they'll resent us. If we're a humble nation but strong, they'll welcome us. And uh, as our nation is, uh, stands, uh, stands alone right now in the world in terms of power. And that's why we've got, we've got to be humble and, uh, and yet project strength in a, in a way that promotes freedom. So I don't, I, don't, I don't think they'll look at us in any way other than what we are. We're a, freedom-loving nation, and if we're an arrogant nation, they'll, they'll view us that way, but if we're a humble nation, they'll respect us. A humble nation. Um, there's not a lot of depth to this, uh, to this response, there, and, but this, this line will come back to haunt Bush as president because his foreign policy doesn't quite correspond to, uh, to, to the idea of, uh, of humility, but nonetheless, this is, this is the approach. Bush wins um, uh, and brings in a quite different national security team. His secretary of state is Colin Powell, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His vice president is, is his father's former defense secretary, Dick Cheney, who emerges as a much more activist, much more conservative figure in Bush too than he was 
in Bush one. Um, his national security advisor is Condoleezza Rice, a, a Stanford professor of, uh, of international relations. His secretary of defense is Donald Rumsfeld, uh, generally an ally of Cheney, more conservative than, uh, than Powell and uh, to a certain extent uh, Rice. Um, his director of central intelligence is the one major holdover from the Clinton administration. Uh, George Tenet, um, and the, the White House Chief of Staff is Andrew Carr. This is a photograph from Vanity Fair. It's, the idea is this, this will be a sophisticated approach to foreign affairs rather than anything, uh, you know, the, the haphazard approach of, uh, of, of the Clinton administration. The, um, the, the Bush team, in, in retrospect, you know, We've looked at a couple of major intelligence failures in this class. The you know, Pearl Harbor, the U.S. fails to detect this when it had it, the, the information was there if they just put two and two together. The Iranian Revolution and the hostage crisis, where the U.S. underestimated the Ayatollah um, and uh, badly, badly underestimated the threat uh, to uh, to American diplomats in in, in 1979. And the 9-11 attacks really are the, are the third major intelligence failure. Now, whether if, if the Bush administration had at, on day one um, come into office saying, you know, we need to focus on Al-Qaeda as our major um, uh, uh, foreign policy threat, it, it, there's no guarantee that they would have been able to, to detect the, the attacks, although there, there was evidence from various FBI uh, uh, offices uh, showing problems. And the reason why they, they may not have been able to detect the attacks is that there was a very strong uh, uh, wall between the FBI and the CIA. There was a fear because of the abuses of power in, in uh, under Nixon in, in the 70s, government had, had said, all right, that you can't really have any kind of coordination between FBI and CIA. So what we had was a situation in which the Al-Qaeda terrorists at, you were being monitored by the CIA, but once they entered the, the US, they had to come under monitoring by the FBI. But the CIA and the FBI couldn't share intelligence information, which in retrospect just seems uh, seems absurd. But even again, even then, there, there was some evidence from FBI field offices in, in Arizona, um, in Minnesota, where you had these Arab students, um, uh, all, all foreign nationals, um, who were interested in learning um, uh, how to fly at American flight schools, um, but were not interested in learning about how to, how to land or take off, which you know, suggested that there was something problematic here. But the, the Bush administration, instead focuses uh, primarily on rogue uh, uh, states. Um, they're, they're animated by a, a foreign policy philosophy known as neoconservatism, um, in which both Cheney and Rumsfeld had been major players during the, uh, during the 1990s. And, and the, the, the neocons argued that the United States needed to be aggressive internationally, willing to use military force against uh, uh, foes of the United States uh, and to, uh, 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 to impose democracy as a result in a belief that this would then create a safer world, um, uh, world order. It's a kind of Wilsonian aspect to this vision, except for that it's a, it's a more forceful use. And so their target, um, you know, during the transition period and then when Bush takes over as, they, as they're kind of rethinking foreign policy, um, is a belief that the major enemy to the United States are, are these rogue states, North Korea, Iraq, Iran, um, three countries that are attempting to develop a nuclear uh, 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 weapon, three countries that fail to respect the, the norms of the international order. And in this, they were absolutely correct that, the, that these countries were threats. The problem was that they were so doctrinaire in, in emphasizing the rogue states, which had been a big uh, theme of the, the, the critique that Rumsfeld in particular had made of Clinton's policy in the 90s, that Clinton wasn't focusing enough on the rogue states. They focused so much on the rogue states that they really lost the ball with regards to, uh, to Al-Qaeda. And so in this critical period from January uh, 2001 until uh, August of 2001, there, there wasn't sufficient attention uh, paid uh, to the to the Al Qaeda uh, threat. We get the attack. Um, then the administration goes into uh, into overdrive. You could argue that there was a sense of of, of panic. Um, uh, uh, Cheney develops this thing called the one percent doctrine, which argues that if there's just a one percent attack of a serious uh, uh, attack on the, the U.S. homeland, a word that suddenly comes into usage after 2001, um, that that justifies a military strike. I mean, and you get a sense almost that some of these, these policymakers 
realized that they had screwed up and then we're now overreacting in the aftermath. But nonetheless, the initial strategy is to uh, is to target uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and if the, the Taliban won't uh, turn uh, bin Laden over to to get um, uh, uh, to capture bin Laden uh, our, ourselves. And the initial strategy is devised by George Tenet, the holdover from the Clinton administration, who notes that the CIA had worked um, with this um, Northern Alliance group, which controlled the northeastern section of Afghanistan, primarily non-Pashtun. Uh, so they're, they're Uzbeks, uh, uh, Tajiks, um, uh, you know, native Afghans, but but of, of, uh, of, of uh, minority ethnicities. Um, they have proven to be a very formidable foe. 9-11 actually starts here in northeastern Afghanistan when bin Laden um, organizes a, a suicide murder attack on the head of the Northern, uh, the Northern Alliance. So the idea is to work with the Northern Alliance and gradually drive the Taliban out of Kabul and the major uh, cities. And this is the plan that's devised by Tenet. And the, the goal here is that this will ensure that there aren't tons of US forces that have to be used in, in the war. And this plan works, um, in, in initially it works brilliantly. Um, so here, here's the situation. As of late um, 2001, all of the green areas have been uh, taken over by US uh, uh, allies with a very small number, you can kind of see from the map here, very small number of, uh, of US troops. The Taliban is eventually isolated in Kandahar here in, in, in Southern um, Afghanistan, but by the end of the year, they're driven out of there as, uh, as well. The Northern Alliance, you know, the, these allies of the U.S. controls most of the uh, the country. The remainder of the country is controlled by Afghan forces that are hostile to the Northern Alliance, but also hostile to uh, 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 to the Taliban. So the Taliban looks as if they've been completely defeated, but bin Laden critically escapes um, across the border into uh, uh, into uh, Pakistan. That said, here's the situation as of 2002, the United States looks omnipotent in the, uh, in the Middle East, um, you know, with significant uh, supplies of US troops in Turkey, uh, in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in the UAE, um, uh, in, in Qatar, in Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan uh, allow for the stationing of, uh, of US uh, uh, troops. Um, and uh, the Taliban has been driven out. Yes, bin Laden hasn't been captured, but nonetheless, it looks as if the Bush approach is going to be a success. Um, and in our next step, it will look at um, what happens uh, then.